All right. Hello. Welcome. So good to see everybody. I felt like I was really missing out on something last week. We didn't have a uh, workshop scheduled and uh, I was feeling at a loss. So we're just going to have to keep these workshops going all the time. I go through withdrawal, I think. <laughs> Joe, we can do it during the school year, right? Sounds good to me. <laughs> all right. We'll get started momentarily. A few more people joining us. So excited you could be with us today. As we're getting settled in, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. Uh, my name is Lori, and I'm a PD specialist here at Code HS. I've been here for a little over two years now. And uh, prior to coming to Code HS, I was in K-12 education for 20 years and uh, was a technology coordinator, district tech coordinator, high school computer science teacher. One of my favorite things ever to teach was cybersecurity um, because there's just so many directions you can go with it. And I think you're going to see that today with uh, what Joe shows us. Welcome, everybody. I think our numbers might be settling down. Hey, Jana. Hey, Cherry. Uh, Hi, Mr. Joe is in the chat. (laughs) Let's see. Greetings. Oh, hey, Mary. I didn't know you were in Georgia. I'm actually flying to Georgia tomorrow morning. Awesome. Get to spend some time with some Atlanta teachers. Ah, good afternoon. Good afternoon to Canada. Cool. Yep. Go ahead and start throwing those introductions in chat. Um, I think our numbers have slowed down now. Um, While we're uh, just getting started, I will also mention that uh, we have a couple of other Code HS team members on the call with us today. We have Lindsay, and Lindsay's also a PD specialist. <laughs> Lindsay is also a PD specialist. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> and uh, we also have Portia on the call with us, and Portia is also a PD specialist. <laughs> All right. Yes, you will definitely be able to access the recording later. <clears throat> In fact, I will be preparing the recording. We'll hopefully get this sent out to you by this evening is my plan. Might be a little later this evening, but we'll get that sent out. All right. Welcome, everybody. And as we're getting started, we do have our fabulous Code HS educator, teacher trainer back with us today, Joe Thompson. Joe is back for another workshop. And uh, he's going to be taking us through some of the things he does with cybersecurity. And I'm so very excited that you're all here for this today. I think you're going to love what Joe has to bring to us. All right. So if you have started throwing your information in chat and started introducing yourself, that is awesome. Go ahead and keep doing that. Um, You can go ahead and let us know where you're coming to us from. Um, We love seeing that. and uh, go ahead and tell us what you're teaching. How, how long have you used Code HS or have you used Code HS, if you'd like? And uh, what's your experience with cybersecurity? What do you teach? Maybe this is your first year teaching cyber. That's so exciting. You're going to love it. Welcome. Hello, hello. Hello to Detroit. Hello to South Carolina, Michigan. West Texas, hello, thank you for joining us. Thanks for coming, Massachusetts. India, we have so many teachers joining us from India. And I have to say, all of our international teachers, India, we've had a lot of uh, teachers from China. Um, You all are on some late, late times. And thank you, we are so honored that you're choosing to join us. Thank you very much for that. All right. Cool. Hello, Philly. Never taught cyber. I think you're going to like it, Matt. There's a lot of really cool things you can do with this. All right. I'm going to go ahead and keep going. You can go ahead and keep tossing your introductions into chat. Lindsay's going to go ahead and toss this, she already did, toss this link into uh, chat for you. If you'd like to access the slides today, um, you can do so by either scanning that QR code or clicking on the link that you see on the screen or in chat codehs.com slash cyber dash exp dash slides. And that will take you out to the slides for today. 
And if you don't, if you're not in a place where you can grab those slides right now, no worries. I will definitely make sure that's in the follow-up recording as well. And uh, it will also be in the workshop section that you'll be enrolling in in just a moment. Cool. Oh, welcome. So welcome to Greece. Thank you for joining us today. So cool. I actually started putting a map together of where our Code HS teachers are coming to us from. And wow, you all are, we have a huge audience from around the world. So I'll have to make sure we publish that on uh, social media somewhere so you can all see that. It's pretty cool. Awesome. Welcome, everybody. All right. And because we do have a larger group today, and you can see how chat is blowing up right now. We want to keep chat open for uh, any links that we want to share. If we want to have some conversations there too, that's a great place. But if you've got questions, we want to make sure we don't miss those. So if you could please add your questions to the question parking lot, that would be phenomenal. So please add any questions to codehs.com slash cyber dash exp dash questions. And that will make sure that we don't miss anything. And if we don't, aren't able to answer a question on this call, we'll make sure to circle back around and get that question answered for you. All right. Welcome everybody. Welcome to Illinois. Oh, few Illinois teachers. Cool. Awesome. All right. So Joe's going to take us through, I'm not even going to spend time on this. Um, <laughs> just know that Joe is going to take us through a ton of really cool um, stuff about teaching cyber security. And if you haven't been to one of Joe's workshops before, I know one of my favorite things are just Joe's stories, where he comes from, how he uses things, his stories about students, his stories about success in the classroom. So I think you are absolutely in for a treat today. All right. <clears throat> if this is your first time with us with Code HS and you don't have an educator account yet, please browse out to codehs.com slash sign up to create one. I am thinking most of our teachers in this room have an account. But for, in case you don't, please take a moment to sign up. It takes just a minute. Um, no worries at all if you need to take a moment to do that. And if you have any questions about doing that, toss your question into the question parking lot. And we'll make sure to help you. And if you have your account, go ahead and sign in. And then please browse to codehs.com slash go slash 2A9B7 to enroll in today's workshop section. Lindsay went ahead and tossed that into chat. Make sure you sign into Code HS and then click that link. I'll actually go ahead and go out there so you can see what it looks like. And there's our section and you can click on join section to join as a student. You will see it from the student perspective. And let me see if I've got, see if I've got too many things on this window. I can refresh real quick. Doing great, Lori. Question parking lot. All right, one more. <clears throat> in order to get the attendance certificate for this workshop, you're going to want to click on codehs.com slash cyber dash exp dash attend. And that is going to um, let you know that you have attended the workshop. Let us know that you've attended the workshop. And after the workshop, I'll go in and trigger those certificates to be sent to everybody who's attended. So if I click this, you should see this. This is the only thing you'll see. And so that lets us know that you are at the workshop and it lets me send you that certificate. That clicking of that link is the important part for that. All right. And I think 
you know, I'm going to stop sharing at this point because I am going to turn it over to our fabulous teacher trainer, Joe Thompson. So Joe, I'm going to let you take it away. Well, good afternoon. I'm, I'm really honored to have uh, teachers from across the world, Greece, India, China. I'm, I'm very grateful to you guys for, for coming and listening today. And uh, I'm just going to talk about what I do in my classroom. And I love to hear your questions. Um, I, I think putting them in the parking lot's a great idea. And please, uh, Lori and CodeHS team, please be sure to uh, jump in and say, you know, hey, we got some questions. Uh, so I'd love to, to talk to you guys directly with your questions. So I'm about three years into teaching cyber. Um, and we have to try to define what we're doing. Um, and it's always a good idea to spend a little time with your students asking them, you know, what the heck cybersecurity is, because they're going to tell you what they've heard. Um, they know it's a great place to get a job. There's a tremendous need for cybersecurity. There are probably a lot of them who have heard from their parents uh, that this is something they really need to include in their education whenever they have an opportunity to take it. And there's quite a, quite a uh, uh, notorious uh, round going on down in the Fairfax County, uh, Virginia public schools about including cybersecurity in uh, their public school curriculum down there. So there's tremendous interest uh, and need. The interest is driven by the need for cybersecurity professionals. And uh, faced with that, we uh, coding teachers tend to be the ones who are looked at to provide some cybersecurity curriculum, although cyber is certainly much bigger uh, discipline than coding. Um, and I, the way I summarize uh, cyber is that we've had this tremendous shift in our entire civilization across the world from a civilization that was not automated and more importantly than that, that was not online to uh, an incredibly automated uh, civilization and a civilization where many important parts of everybody's everyday life take place online on the internet. The one that comes to mind is banking, but insurance, uh, real estate, I mean, things that you think of as very important, fueling your car, uh, taking care of your family, all, a lot of that stuff has, has shifted very quickly uh, online. And as, as we as a civilization started taking advantage of the efficiencies that putting things online bring and the way that businesses and, and agencies can scale quickly by going online, um, those, those areas of important areas of human life have vulnerabilities that came up as we were putting all these things online. And now those things have to be protected. And that's how you tell, how I tell my students what cyber is and what we're doing. And then that's, that sort of paves the way for saying how large of a discipline cybersecurity potentially is. Um, our students now, because things go across networks, things are done uh, in conjunction with the operating system of computers and things are done with an awful lot of hardware, which you all know because you know how many uh, automated things there are in your lives, uh, 22 computers in a car, automated doorbells, not that unusual to have 20 or 30 devices or more online in a single household. And all those things are potential uh, points of vulnerability. And the way that they connect to each other is also a point of vulnerability. Your routers, your home network, uh, then satellites that carry uh, network signals, et cetera. All those potential points of vulnerability, all those need to be protected. It's a huge multifaceted discipline and there is a tremendous need for cyber cyber people across all industries i mean we were shocked to see uh, ransomware attacks on hospitals uh, and you know the the uh, actors who are threatening uh, underpinnings of our civilization they're not uh, holding back because of some sector that they feel is too important to uh, to attack so there are tremendous opportunities, and I'm I'm drawn to do things that will I believe give my students opportunities, and uh, I certainly think 
there's a tremendous need for uh, cyber practitioners. And I would also say that I find coding in general and cyber in particular is a bit of a shortcut to, uh, not a shortcut, it's a, it's, a, it's a way to establish yourself in a profession as quickly as possible. In other words, if you're gonna be a medical doctor, of course, you're gonna go all the way through college and then you're gonna go all the way through med school and then you're gonna do a residency and some other things and then you will begin being a doctor. Well, what my students are finding is that in a relatively short period of time, they have enough skill to be visible as somebody that a company or an agency would wanna train. So I have students who uh, in their senior year of high school are working, uh, you know, putting in 20, 40 hours a week uh, at agencies and they're making contributions. And uh, more commonly, American students who have some facility with coding or with cyber will find that uh, they will get offered opportunities in the middle of college and those will be paid internships in the summertime, sometimes paid internships during the school year. And those internships uh, pave the way to permanent positions. So it would be very normal for your students that you teach in high school to expect that in just a couple of years, they will be attractive to a company or an agency who will hire them first in the summertime and then the day after they graduate from college at a very, very good salary. And, uh, you know, if you're if you're doing what we do in order to help your students have opportunities to move ahead in life, um, that's a pretty neat aspect of, of what we're doing. And sometimes you have to get your students ready a little bit and say, you know, not everybody is ready to go to work, you know, at age 17 or 18 and, and put in a 40 hour week. But this is this is what this particular uh, discipline can carry with it. Um, so you need to be thinking about that. OK, let me move my slide ahead. There we go. OK, um, so this is an interesting picture. This is a. Uh, uh, happens to be a Russian hacker who likes to drive around uh, Moscow in his Lamborghini that has about the most flamboyant paint job I've ever seen. Um, and I, I do this because this, is, this picture is kind of a juxtaposition of one image of a hacker um, with a, the new reality, which is that uh, the targets are so large and so important and the prizes are so large that we now have in our arena, we're defending against uh, state actors um, who are employing um, employing hackers as part of government or military operations and uh, reaping enormous benefits from uh, using hackers as a weapon. And um, this guy, you know, does a lot of work with the, the Russian government. Let's keep going. Um, there is a famous hack um, of Equifax that uh, yielded up something like 128 million separate um, people's personal information, about as personal as you could get and as complete as you could get. It was very well done. And uh, this is a very fancy building. I think it's in Shanghai, the Pearl Tower. And that is headquarters to a People's Liberation Army unit that was um, found by the Justice Department in 2017 to have executed this hack on Equifax. So. We don't just have a state actor there. We have a very um, powerful and important and large numbers of people working on uh, big hacks. And this is a little more detail on uh, this. It was 143 million, or actually revised to 148 million names, birth dates, social security numbers, et cetera. And, uh, so I just say we're there. The if you are still laboring under the idea that uh, cybersecurity is about stopping sort of a kid on the other side of the world or a kid in your own neighborhood um, from hacking into your school and changing grades, uh, you're up against uh, your students will be up against something that's an awful lot bigger than that. And then we have a uh, well-known North Korean state actor. And again, you know, these guys are uh, well-organized units of the um, North Korean army. 
So, uh, at the start of, of the Ukraine war, uh, the Russian military, this is a Washington Post story, uh, the Russian military began the war by doing the best they could to disable satellite communications uh, from Ukraine. So just uh, you, you can you can investigate a little more what these guys are. So let's take a look at what some of the expectations are for um, skills that you might need. And this is not coming from uh, this is not coming from me. This is from an agency saying, you know, your our students should be learning Linux, uh, learning Bash, learning command line, and. Um, I can't say that strongly enough. I think that's one of the best things you can do for your students is to teach them command line stuff. And there is there are things in the Code HS course that speak to that. Uh, learning networking is really important. Um, Kali and Metasploit, you always hear about the Kali distribution of Linux. Um, I actually kind of think uh, that it's not as important to focus in on that one version of Linux, but just to get comfortable with uh, a version of Linux, uh, Ubuntu or something like that, and learning to run it from the command line, moving up and down a file system, uh, moving across directories, super important. And then we get to that fourth bullet point uh, where how do you take a look at a network in a recon way without necessarily completely penetrating it, getting an idea of what that network looks like what machines are on it, uh, what are its, uh, in, what's its infrastructure, et cetera. Looking at Python scripting is also an important thing, but I guess my, my summary of this page would be that cyber is, because we teach it, because we coding teachers tend to teach it, everybody, the outside world will think that cyber is sort of an extension of coding or some sort of giant version of coding. And it's really an awful lot more uh, than that. And it's up to us to make sure that our students understand that they're gonna be uh, fooling around with some things, uh, problem solving, uh, learning skills, learning now networks work uh, that's not quite really programming. It's not what they think of as programming. Okay. So let's see if I can bring this down. <clears throat> I want to make sure that my international audience doesn't misinterpret this little film. I still want to show it to you because it, it, it's it's a it's a little clip from a, from an Apple Plus Apple TV Plus uh, series called For All Mankind, and basically it, it's the uh, first season takes place following on the idea an alternate timeline where the Russians get to the moon first, and you have this sort of spirit infusing NASA that we're gonna compete and we're gonna respond. And that is what I get out of this, uh, you know, little clip of Gene Krantz, a speech Gene Krantz could have given at a two minute hold before Apollo 11. So uh, international guys, please don't, uh, this, is, this is not me waving the flag. It's, it's more like we're all together, all of us, responding to a tremendous need to secure our networks, um, our business networks um, from uh, people that wanna take them down or acquire data that we don't want them to have. And I'm still gonna show you the clip. Let's go to the next slide. <laughs> Let's go to the next slide. There we go. All right, I'm gonna tell you, first of all, again, I hope that you don't misinterpret what I just showed you. It's just an example of how important uh, and how large this mission is that we all, all of us practicing cyber, all of our students have to respond to this challenge of trust breaking down in, in uh, large networks. And you know, I, I heard it again a couple of weeks ago when I was up at Dartmouth. Um, it's so important to maintain trust. And that's that's what that video is all about. So now I'm gonna tell you a little bit, take it back down uh, from Gene Kranz talking to NASA and piano playing in the background to kind of my story. 
and I've been teaching coding for eight years, which is not a long time. Probably a whole lot of people in this audience that have been teaching longer than that um, coding. But certainly a lot of people in this audience who are much better coders than I am. But I did have the idea as I was moving along with my teaching career that cyber was important. And that drove me. And in addition to the fact that I saw lots of opportunities coming up the pipe for our students and for people to practice cybersecurity. It's, it's there. There are people requ uh, requesting that I send applications into their company and their agency, getting calling me on the phone saying, when are we going to get more applications from you guys? We love your guys. So before I started work at the school where I am now, McDonough School, in uh, fall of 2019, I knew we were going to enter the first ever Lockheed Martin CyberQuest competition. And I thought it'd be a good idea for the guys that I thought might want to enter that to get working on it, even though it was at an awkward time of year, October, early October, and it was going to be my first fall teaching here. So my predecessor in this job uh, gave me a few names of people I'd talked to, and I, I got them together here in school over the summer. And we started working on it. And uh, that group turned out to be pretty amazing. We had two, uh, two second interviews out of the five people and one person who was hired for an internship. Um, so that was another illustration of the incredible opportunities that are out there. Uh, CyberQuest is a competition sponsored by Lockheed Martin. And I had another guy that went to work at NASA Greenville, which is not too shabby. Let's go to the next slide. So my first class of cyber that I taught was in spring of 2020, and that was the spring that the pandemic hit. And so I had five uh, seniors in there who were in there, I don't think with the world's greatest motivation. Um, we've all had sliding seniors. Uh, I did have one guy who was really incredible, you know, worked really hard and, and uh, he actually got hired by Lockheed Martin the next year. <laughs> Um, and one of the things that happened there was that while we were meeting, uh, we were meeting it over Zoom during that initial phase of the pandemic, we did uh, CTF Learn, which I'll be getting to later, and you're all going to get to try CTF Learn today. Um, that's not a part of Code HS, but it's a part of what I do. And uh, I also teach uh, mobile. And so I teach now uh, mobile in the fall, sorry, mobile in the spring and cyber in the fall. And that particular year I was teaching cyber in the spring. Uh, and I had a student hired at a government agency for a work study um, in the academic year 2020 to 2021. That was a pretty interesting uh, situation where she was taking her senior year and, and uh, working at an agency um, half the time to, to 20 hours a week. And then uh, Lockheed Martin hired another uh, one of my students in the summer of 2020 to be an internship, which I'm quite proud of. Uh, spring, so Lockheed Martin had another CyberQuest competition in the spring of 2021. It was their second, second time doing this. And they, um, it, it was a completely virtual competition, including them trying to run a, an attack network uh, purely online and there were all kinds of technical problems which I, I I can't blame I can't say that the Lockheed Martin guys didn't do a great job it just was tough having people all over the world and everything totally virtual uh, so our teams went we were able to connect all the environments and I thought our guys did really well um, if you attend a competition uh, you might want to think twice before complaining about what's going on at the competition they actually turned the competition off after a couple hours and they had another one this past year, which was, which went better. Uh, one of my students got an internship with the Baltimore police where he did forensics. Uh, this is the past summer. Um, and then uh, two students and an alum, that guy, one of the guys from my very first cyber class got internships at Lockheed um, and just more proof that there's all kinds of opportunities for our students. This isn't me bragging. This is me trying to communicate to you guys that when you think this is something you can teach students and they can prepare and get hired and feed their families well, you know, this has been my experience. And that's one of the reasons I'm in front of you guys today. 
uh, I had two students who uh, were awarded agency work studies for uh, 2021 to 2022. And that was a very long process, but that worked out well for them. One's at Duke or about to start at Duke and other one's about to start at Georgia Tech. Um, that has been a fantastic uh, thing that I love bragging about. So now we come back to last fall, 2021, my third iteration of the course. Uh, at that point, CodeHS had done some updating. I also use uh, Linda Lavender's book called Principles of Cybersecurity, which is aimed at high school students. And we've had some students going for certifications, including a cyber certification. I'm, I'm gonna talk quite a bit about uh, getting your kids aimed towards uh, the CodeHS Cyber Level 1 cert. And um, I, I strongly encourage you to start them on a path of uh, preparing for and earning certifications. And it's my opinion that the Code HS badges, the Code HS certs are a great, great way to get students uh, into the rhythm of preparing for and earning certifications. And those certifications will help your students uh, set themselves apart as job applicants and internship applicants. Uh, also in 2021, I had a Stokes winner. It's just a fantastic uh, agency internship and scholarships uh, aimed at minorities. Um, they pay $30,000 a year for college for up to five years. And you have a job waiting for you when you graduate from college. Um, so I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of that particular um, scholarship. Another one of my guys uh, just won the Stokes this past year. Really proud of him. Uh, my second class in fall of 2021, I went from having had five my first year to having 20, uh, 19 students. We try to max out at 15 in this school. 19 is still not a lot of students compared to what a lot of you guys teach, but it was a very full class. There was other students that we couldn't get into that class. Um, and uh, that's a reflection, I think, both in student interest and in parents' interest. So you have parents out there who may be doing something involved in IT or that in just a pure business sense, they're aware of this incredible need that there is out there for cyber. And so you'll have parents saying to students, well, you we have a chance to take a cyber course, you better get that on your, in your curriculum. And this summer, summer of 22, as I'm speaking to you, I have three cyber interns at Lockheed Martin, and I've had three other cyber internships at different places and a whole bunch of scholarships. So I'm feeling like I, my students have done exceptionally well. And I'm really proud of the things that they have accomplished. I just got back uh, three weeks ago from a visit to Dartmouth College where I was with uh, Professor Sean Smith at the ISTS, uh, which is a going concern up there. It's been going for about 20 years. It's their cybersecurity lab, and they have some interesting contracts there. And it was great to sit, uh, to take five of my students up there and sit with Professor Smith and a couple of his grad students and just talk about what kinds of things uh, we ought to be doing as high school students to get our students ready for not just college cyber, but these internships that are out there. What is, what is the need? And I, I, I feel like Professor Smith has a great perspective on this. And I'll drop a few other things into my conversation about my visit to Dartmouth. But one thing that he said that I will hang on to is, is stay close to the hardware. So he's in very much in favor of uh, studying computer languages and electronics that allow you to have a good close relationship with uh, the hardware that these languages run on. So this is a ISTS uh, screenshot of the web page, uh, talks a little bit about it. You can find out more about ISTS um, by looking around the Dartmouth website. And there's a picture of Professor Smith. He's got a little more hair now than he had when he took this picture. Um, and uh, he's done quite a bit of work with IoT security. You can see him messing around with a cantenna there. Um, uh, 
interesting article title there, I am Joe's fridge. <laughs> He's done a lot of IoT security stuff. So what's going on with me talking about C here when CodeHS doesn't offer a C course? And the answer is we can all exhale because uh, there's a great pathway to the C language. And I, I and other people I've spoken to say that the smart thing to do to get ready to write C code, don't not write C code, but the way to get ready to write C code is Java. So if you have one year of students who are in intro as my students are, and then a second year they're learning Java, they're getting ready to uh, do important IoT stuff in the C language. Um, and I'm sure there are a number of you guys who are um, better coders than me who could tell you, who could tell the rest of us all the different things that C offers that helps manage memory. Um, and it, like Java, as Java looks verbose compared to something like Python, what I tell my students when we're learning Java is Java has the features that let us build large projects. and uh, C has features that let us manage memory. So if we have small or relatively slow processors, we can still get things done efficiently. And then in spring of this past year, I, I had a hard time tracking down how many teams were in the competition, but they put us all in, uh, in um, everybody in the DMV was in one big virtual pool. I don't think it was quite 50, but it was an awful lot of teams. And my guys came in third. We had uh, four teams in that competition. And um, I just can't tell you how proud I am of, of their achievement there. And that was done in a CTF style competition. And I'll talk to you, as a matter of fact, in this seminar, we're gonna get a chance to try um, some CTF learn stuff. Let's see, let me click. All right, so again, uh, what do I think are important cyber skills? Um, certainly command line stuff, cryptography and cryptanalysis. Uh, SQL, I think you can't skip over or look around. I think SQL is a database language that is used by hackers to essentially transmit commands to the database that lies behind things like a login screen. When you uh, give a login and a password, you are essentially giving an instruction to a database to open a file to, or to, open, to find you in that database. So SQL is used, uh, a database language is used to run the database. And if you enter SQL commands on a login screen, you potentially could have access to parts of that database. So learning SQL is important. Uh, web hacking, I think is important. Networking, I think it's, it continues to shock me how little our students know about how networks work. And it's hard to learn how networks work, but I don't think there's a lot of substituting. There's, it's hard to get around the need to get a fairly sophisticated understanding of networking. So you're gonna have to, as a cyber teacher, take what you can from the Code HS course, take it from other places and make it a priority for your students because they're not walking into your class going, wow, cyber, that's where I'm going to learn all about networking and I'm going to learn how to subnet and I'm going to learn, you know, I'm going to be the world's greatest uh, binary uh, to decimal converter and everything's going to get easy. They're not, that's not their thought as they come in to see you, but you, they've got to learn uh, some networking and that ITF plus cert We'll call for that, certainly down the line with the CompTIA certs, they're gonna need that. So try to introduce some networking in your class and the CodeHS does offer a couple of modules and lessons that focus on that. Now, like every other profession or discipline, cyber has its own jargon. Uh, you know, red team, blue team, offensive cyber, defensive cyber. There's a lot of, there are a lot of specialized uh, terms that your students who are learning cyber are going to need to master. And there's no way around it. Uh, they need to be fluent in the jargon of cyber. And I think that's going to help them in interview, uh, in internship interviews, uh, if they are comfortable with the terminology that people like to sling around, just as they do in, in every other profession. And then finally, uh, you could in a sort of dry way, an academic kind of way, 
look at these various certs or especially contest results and say, well, that's not everything that there is in the profession or you don't really necessarily understand everything about cyber because you got a good score in a contest or because you have X cert. And I, I completely understand that. But it, at the same time, I'm, I strongly feel that it shortens job interviews and that it is worthwhile. It is that the, that the certs, particularly the ones I'm gonna talk about are worth doing and participating in contests and getting good scores are worth doing and they, they will help make you better at cyber. So Lori dropped this fantastic cube into the, uh, into the uh, slide here. And Lori, I wanted to ask you um, if you have some questions I'd like to field at this point. I'm not seeing any questions yet, okay. <clears throat> but I think that, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that if anybody has any questions, this would be a great point to go ahead and toss those into chat if you like, or maybe even unmute if it's a longer question. That's fine too. And I, I have not yet had hit anything on Code HS, but I'm about to. <laughs> oh, here we go, Joe. Um, what does DMV and CTF stand for? Okay. CTF is simply capture the flag, basically. Um, I don't know where you got the DMV question from, um, but CTF would be a, a capture the flag format of a contest or a, a format of learning. And I'm gonna show you CTF Learn, which is one of many uh, platforms. And it's something I use in my classroom. Um, you know, I might just go there right now by way of explanation here. Let me See if I can shrink this down. I'm still sharing my screen. Move this. Let's go here. Okay. So this is a website called ctflearn.com. And there are a number of capture the flag contests. Uh, Lockheed Martin CyberQuest is run in this sort of format where you have various uh, degrees of difficulty of, uh, and they're awarded points for solving problems. And um, I really like this particular one as a way to introduce students to CTF. Uh, and you, I would encourage you to start your students on the easy level of difficulty and start with the, um, you know, very easiest one, like a practice flag where they're essentially looking through a document and finding something called a flag there and then pasting it in. So if we dive into this practice flag, let's see if I can do it, maybe I can't. This always gets me in trouble. So you take this flag right here and just paste it in there and you would get points for that. But the, the um, let's look at, um, the different categories. And this will again, help us sort of define what cyber is um, another way. And we see that in CTF Learn, we have seven areas of effort, um, web hacking, forensics, uh, binary, uh, reverse engineering, cryptography, and programming. And programming might be something as simple as coming up with a little Python script to get into um, something and then miscellaneous. So I really like this actually, you know, what you can do, you guys can do with your students, uh, I still haven't hit any cut HS stuff yet today, is uh, take your cyber students and basically tell them, get on CTF Learn and go get me some points. And then you'll be able to see them score points on this dashboard here. And they really like the idea that they're gonna score some points and that there will be a record of them and you'll be able to, to track them. And, and I would actually, uh, when, I, when I put my students on CTF Learn, I uh, will have them work in a couple of teams. Um, they will have to create an account on CTF Learn, but it's completely free um, platform. So the questions are great. I will also say that there are videos, explainers, um, for most of the easy problems that you can find on YouTube that will tell you how to solve the problem and what skills you might learn by doing that. I also want to point out another feature of this site, 
which is ctflearn.com. And that is that they actually have some labs here and you heard me earlier uh, pointing out how important it is to learn Linux and to be able to be comfortable uh, moving around on the command line, which is really going to set your students apart as they pursue cyber, if they can get themselves comfortable in Linux. Um, they can open up a terminal if they have a Mac. They can do some work on the command line in Windows. There are other opportunities for them to, to just open a Linux window right up. Um, one of the first things I like to do with my students with Linux is have them run the date command, um, which prints out the dates or prints out a calendar. It does all kinds of things. So these labs are also good in here, and I, I would certainly include these uh, labs in your, um, in your work. So that's a little bit about CTF Learn. Lori, did I, do you think I answered the question reasonably well? Mm -hmm. I think so. Right. Um, we had another really good question that just came in, and this is something that we hear about from schools all the time. How do you suggest getting around command line programming when the tech director has justified fears of students having that much access to the network? Oh, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we had a pretty famous situation here at school where we started talking about robots.txt in uh, my very first iteration of my cyber class. And of course the geniuses in my class, the five geniuses decided that it would be really cool to look at the robots.txt file on our school's website. And about five minutes later, the phone rang and it was my IT director saying, you know, get your guys up in my office right now. So my answer to that is communicate is, is let your, your, school IT manager know what you're doing and talk to them about the challenges that you face. And, uh, you know, uh, that will help an awful lot. And there may be some things that they come back to you and say, you, you can't do that. But more often what they're going to do is say, how can we help do this? And as a matter of fact, the IT director here at my school now is proactively working with me to set up a, a target network where we could have it sort of set apart from the rest of the school and do some offensive uh, stuff um, because he knows that's, you know, probably the best way to learn. So, you know, I, my answer to that question, that's a very important question, uh, is number one, communicate and communicate before you run uh, a lesson live in your class. Um, but I still will say, that Linux is super important and learning these tools and learning things like packet sniffing. There's no way around that. You've got to, you, you've got to be teaching that. So you might want to talk to your IT director and say, Hey, to what extent would you be comfortable with us running uh, a packet sniffing tool? Uh, do we need to run it just on a, and look at, look at sample packet sniffs, or is there some other way we can, we can do this. And so I would suggest that you, begin that conversation. How's that for an answer, Lori? I like that. <clears throat> yeah, and Mary had mentioned that um, she was trying to build a standalone network that can't connect mm -hmm. to the district. You can yeah. definitely do that. That's, you know, something I did as well. <clears throat> I was actually the, the IT department mm -hmm. <laughs> in my school district. And, sure. uh, but I, I still blocked access to command lines. So that was my workaround was an isolated network. Okay. Well, I'm in favor of that. So what we'll have to do is come up with some nice answers, but do not, uh, do not say we're not going to teach uh, command line or Linux because our students that we, that do learn command line and Linux successfully will be really have set themselves apart. I think there's a huge divide, a huge uh, gap between cyber people or would be cyber people or cyber candidates or even people who want to get into Professor Smith's courses at Dartmouth who are comfortable on the command line moving up and down a directory structure or comfortable SSHing into a device that's in another network um, or that's somewhere else on the network uh, that you can only do use uh, command line tools to get to. Uh, and those who are uncomfortable and unfamiliar with uh, working uh, at the command line. So we got to keep it as a priority and communicate and of course be ready to listen 
be ready to hear your IT director say you can't do that. I mean, you, you're not going to, you know, win an argument with them on what you can and can't do. But I, I think that, um, I think some communication will get you places with that, Lori. Definitely. <clears throat> I couldn't agree more. All right. So let's, um, let's push forward a little bit. Hey, Joe, let's, before we do that, I think this is a perfect point to take a quick break. Let's maybe give everybody a quick stretch break. Um, We're at about five minutes before the top of the hour. So Mm -hmm. let's go ahead and uh, go ahead and take five minutes and let's come back right at uh, noon central, one Eastern time. And uh, Joe will continue from there. Thanks everybody.
You all are definitely asking some good questions. I think some of the things that you're thinking about are absolutely things that other teachers are thinking about. It's, cybersecurity can be a tough subject sometimes just because there is so many uh, security issues. <laughs> so yeah. I, rec I recall being at a cybersecurity workshop um, for teachers many, many years ago. It was actually a security plus workshop. And I also remember the day that the, uh, the state called us. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> because we did some things and didn't let anybody know we were doing them. <laughs> So All right. you know, I, I think that is such an important question, Lori. And, you know, those teaching coding, you, you're constantly running up against things that are difficult or would be easier if we had this tool or somebody's, we, I wish we had this. And it can even be a factor in how we use code HS because not all of us have big budgets to work with. And can some, some people here are teaching on the free version of code HS. So the challenge is to present to your students things that they can do. And there are plenty, plenty of cyber things that your students can do that don't require uh, approval of the, of the department. Don't take, you know, months of meetings and try to try to work from strength there and just work with what you can do. And, you know, is, is authorized, including, you know, if you, if you get into the CTF learn, you use the code HS course, your work through those lectures and slides and you follow the news, uh, the, the news about cyber and you look for other things you can use in your cyber classes. You know, there's, there's an awful lot that you can do and that will help your students prepare for their futures in cyber. Um, you know, you can start with, uh, if you're, if you're looking at certs, you know, just that list of requirements of the cert, the list of requirements, if you're looking for a map for your students to success and you begin with the, uh, CompTIA network plus and CompTIA security plus certifications, and just look at those list of topics and do everything you can to familiarize yourself with all those, you're going to be in a great place. Absolutely. So I think I'm going to move in. We're going to dive on to uh, the courses, the Cut Chess courses, and let's go. That's Perfect. That for you. Let's go. Let's go. So we have two levels now, and I'm very grateful that there are two levels of Cut Chess. There's a Fundamentals of Cybersecurity course and an Advanced Cybersecurity course, and um, one of the really magic things I, about Code HS to me is that throughout their curriculum, they're pitched very well at, I think they're pitched very well at high school students, sometimes at the expense of younger students, sometimes at the expense of adult learners. And I, I put high school students in a completely different category of people than adult learners and career changers. And if you go out on the internet, you look at YouTube, you look at Udemy, you look at Udacity, you're going to see a lot of courses that are very sophisticated and have a ton of content in them that are pitched at adult learners and career changers. But we have to remember that our high school students that we're teaching, however passionate they may be for cyber, their day is completely different than an adult's day, even a busy adult's day, because Adult learners and career changers will sit themselves down somewhere in the evening, maybe after they've completed their other responsibilities and they can work for a couple hours. Well, high school students, attention spans aren't that long to begin with, and they just don't have that much free time. They've got to sort of dive in and dive out. And there's a real difference between material, in my opinion, there's a real difference between material that's suitable for high school students and suitable for adult learners and career changers. And if you can sort of learn to paint that stuff with the appropriate brush and you're gonna go out there and you're gonna find a great Linux course somewhere and bring it into your classroom and that's fantastic. But you need to also be thinking, oh, this thing was built for a adult learner career changer and it's an hour and a half long lecture. I better divide it up into several sections, sessions for my students and take be careful that we're following each piece of it. So high school students are busy. They have a lot of people pulling at them. 
And so that's a compelling reason to push forward with the code HS material and their fundamentals of cybersecurity, I think is as good an introduction as you can get for a high school student. Now, one other thing about high school students compared to middle school or younger students is high school students want to run away as fast as they can from things like cartoon characters and anything that looks like middle school, which is kid stuff to them. So they're not quite, they don't have time to, to attack things in the way an adult learner career changer would, but they really want to be seen and to do that. And not only that, but we have to talk to them that way like adults, because they're going to be faced pretty quickly with some opportunities to do some pretty grown up things. So let's look at this fundamentals of cybersecurity. It's completely web-based, which is a blessing. You can hop on code HS using a Chromebook. If you want to, you could, I've seen it work on an iPad. Um, you know, there are a lot of tools that are, would be nice to have if you decide you want to get really good at cyber. One of the nice tools would be a Raspberry Pi, which uh, right now those things cost a lot of money. They're, they're north of 200 bucks, but hopefully they're straighten out their supply chain issues and you'll be back to uh, 35, 50 bucks for a um, very good Linux computer, Raspberry Pi. So here we have the module breakdown of the Code HS Fundamentals of Cybersecurity course. And we see that in the first one we talk, first module, we talk about what the heck is cybersecurity. And I actually do think as much as I like to get students going in, in the discipline that we're working on, it, it's important to talk about what the heck this is because usually it's a lot bigger than students uh, think it is. And there's a lot, there are a lot more topics and problems involved uh, than they think. So this is a nice module to talk about. Digital citizenship and cyber hygiene, important. Uh, I kind of tend to go relatively quickly through this one. Um, there's a concept called a tax surface. I think that's worth throwing out at this point, which is sort of everything that you do online, which is an awful lot of stuff. And how does each aspect of your online life uh, make you vulnerable to attack. Um, research resources, you know, I don't know. But and then there's a little section in here about programming that most of you will have probably covered uh, in other classes. Uh, but it's important, you know, if you're going from JavaScript to Java, for example, or starting to fool around with C, uh, to think about data types and strongly typed languages and why, why would you ever choose to use an int if you could just make everything a double? Well, the, the reality is that ints take a lot less memory space than doubles and floats. Um, why, what types of arrays would you choose for things, et cetera? So there's some material in this programming uh, module that's good. Cryptography, I think, is a really important fundamental of cyber and understanding Getting, getting your students to have enough of an understanding of cryptography so that they can understand how things are broken or how things can be broken, what's a brute force attack, uh, how powerful of a computer might you need, what are the types of tools that are easily available to uh, hackers out there, uh, and how does, how does cryptography work? To what extent is a various encryption system helpful. And I think this is a nice pathway into, let me go back for a second. Yeah, I think this module is a very good one. So of these first four, I would stress the first one, what is cyber? And the fourth one, ABCs of cryptography. Let me, let me run through the other modules in the fundamentals, and then I'll actually dive into the assignments and we'll take a look. System administration, uh, you know, we know that the OS is an important uh, area to look at for vulnerabilities. Uh, the OS needs to be patched, et cetera. How does, how does authentication happen in various OSs? How are things authorized? What's the difference between an administrator and a regular user? Uh, and in that section, you do get some command line work in the system administration one. And then we have a section that has SQL in it. And I think that's great, uh, the software security section in the fundamentals one. 
Uh, and then we have a networking uh, fundamentals part and we have to start somewhere and you could do a lot worse than starting with this code HS networking fundamentals um, uh, section of the fundamentals of cyber. And then finally infrastructure. And this, this I had pounded into me up at Dartmouth that you've got to have, uh, you really need starting fairly early with high school students to give them a kind of a feel for hardware. So I actually have students building circuits in my classroom now um, using a Raspberry Pi and just some jumper cables and trying to make an LED blink, but just to get a feel for how hardware works, what are the, what's a motherboard, you know, what does RAM really do? What are routers, that kind of thing. IT infrastructure, nice section. So let me flip my page to the fundamental one. There it is. So now we're into, um, Lori, can you guys see my screen okay? So now we're into this um, fundamentals here. And, and I would say in this first section, what is cybersecurity? And I have a few things done and that'll happen as you, as you work through this, um, that, uh, some of the some of the things in here that are writing, I would sort of not extremely stress, but there's a lot of good content here. And particularly, I'd say what jumps out at me is this one for the CIA triad where you're going to want to um, take a good look at this lesson with your students. CIA, of course, not being the agency here. And what I usually do with my students is I will choose slides rather than the video, although the narration is really good and it's a good option for your students to do. And I'll just work through the deck with them. So I'll go down here to the bottom left and click forward through the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And as you talk about particular clinical aspects of a hack, like for example, if I was going to have students look, at, look over that... Um, uh, Equifax hack, I would ask them to tell me, you know, how that affected confidentiality, how it affected data integrity, and how it affected availability. Um, and so you can, you can sort of begin to introduce them into some of these terms and some of the important jargon of um, cyber, CIA, CIA being one of the important goals that we all have. And there's some nice deck definitions and you, I think we'll find that CutHS works very nicely if you take your students through these slides and they hear your voice uh, for a lot of it. Then they're always able to go and look back and take notes on the lecture if they wish to. All right, so and then availability is making sure that things are available to your users. So you, you know, this is constantly a challenge that your students are going to be facing is how, how much do we have to deny to our regular users who are counting on our service or our product being available in order to secure it. You could make something perfectly secure that didn't function and uh, that wouldn't be any good to anybody. So this balancing out availability um, with confidentiality and data integrity, super important. So here we go, uh, you know, talking about these terms, basically, which one confidentiality, integrity, and availability are we talking about when we're talking about somebody who could change the grades of her assignments to all A pluses? And if you have, uh, if the site crashes before you see all your grades, then that means you don't have availability of that. So this is a nice um, slide deck here. Confidentiality, integrity, availability, absolute cornerstone of uh, cyber practice. And this is pointing out, and I might as well talk about this cert right now, that uh, the CompTIA ITF plus alignment is here. And I, I give, um, I give Code HS a ton of credit as they were structuring this course for looking at a cert that was out there, a very good cert called ITF Plus, which is aimed at high school students. 
um, that I wish more of my students would take. Uh, they're interested in it. It's, I think, over $200, maybe something like $270 for the cert right now. So I have a little work to do to get my students to see that as important. But I think for Code HS, this was a great uh, thing to do. And I, I'm looking forward to them uh, doing more with aligning their courses to certs in the future. This is a, a great thing that they did. Um, now let's continue here. So then you have a little quiz, which is great uh, in this lesson. Um, let's go back into my talk. And let's see, let's go back. Digital citizenship and cyber, cyber hygiene. I'm gonna take a look at them and tell you guys some things that I might want you to not pay as much as close attention to or to jump further forward. Let's go. Lessons. Here we go. Minimize. I also, by the way, recommend that you get in the habit of removing these quizzes from the end of the modules because um, you want to be the one that pre uh, presents the students with the quiz. If you remove them from the modules before the year starts, um, then you can decide if you want to maybe print them out and give them to the students on paper when you want to when you want them to, to take it. So they sort of naturally come with these quizzes attached and across all the different Code HS courses. Now we go to module two of fundamentals. Um, and I think, I think you can move a little, you know, fairly quickly through here. Uh, creative credit and copyright is an important topic and certainly been a, been a big issue in cyber. You, the one that comes to mind is the Sony Pictures hack, of course, where copies of movies were released and all kinds of emails were given out. Um, but I, I think, we're in some danger of overstressing, not stressing. Obviously, we get into some ethical questions, and we just had that discussion about, well, we need to talk to our IT directors about our students not doing things we don't want them to do. And you need to kind of have that in the back of your head, you know, thinking about if, if there's some students that maybe shouldn't be learning these skills. Um, but I think you can go, I think you can go too far you can spend too much time here because everybody who's in the class and you as a teacher have a mission of teaching your students cybersecurity and uh, you can spend an awful lot of time on the sort of DevOps or, you know, the human aspects of this. And I think our students are maybe better served by um, going relatively quickly through this and sticking with the hands-on skills of doing cyber. And if that's controversial, I'd be happy to have a discussion with that, uh, about with people about that. So now we, we can take a look. There's a project salted in here, which is nice, doing public service announcements. Um, and then there's this unit of programming. And, um, you know, if your students have done Carol, they're gonna be okay here looping. This is one you're gonna have to decide to what extent that is something that you want to include in this course. You certainly do want to be talking about the different languages and how relevant they are. Um, you know, scripting, straight ahead scripting language is very different from a Java or a C. And, you know, if you're talking about Internet of Things, small, slow devices uh, or even cars, you want, a, you want a language that's going to give you control over that stuff. Um, so, you know, I, I typically... We, we present at my school cyber as a class that a student who's already had a year or two of high school programming would be taking. And I would not uh, enroll a student in cyber who hadn't had uh, programming in the hopes that they would just learn a little bit of programming in the, along with their cyber. So it presents a problem of, you know, am I keeping anybody out by saying you shouldn't you should have some programming behind you before you start cyber. I don't really think so. Um, so it's an interesting question to, to what extent this is here. And you can, you can take a look through this particular module and see how it fits for you. Then we get into cryptography and cryptanalysis, which is 
very well done module. I would definitely include this and a uh, nice little history uh, deck here, um, really in-depth discussion of Caesar Cipher and cracking it and then the Visionaire. Um, uh, really nice, nice module here. This is, a, this is a good one to include in your classes. And again, I would typically in my year keep this, um, uh, keep this quiz out at the beginning. And then we have a unit on system administration, um, browser configuration, command line interfaces here, uh, comparing operating systems, very well done. I, I think this is, this is a keep it, keep most of it in your classes. And then we hit the software security module and absolutely great uh, SQL section here, uh, SQL injection, super important. Uh, software security here, good discussion of what a client and a server is, and very important to have that discussion uh, because your students are used to uh, not seeing a server. And if they're, you know, we're all talking about the cloud these days, and my pathway into that is first discuss a server and then uh, say, well, it just ha sort of happens to be the fact that a lot of servers are spun up virtually out of other machines that live in uh, places like the Equinix in, um, in Virginia. Um, what is a database? Nice lesson. Value of data, very important. Um, now you will see these uh, reflections here. And you know, if there, you, you don't, you can sort of pick your battles here with respect to having students write an awful lot. Um, not necessary to have them fill out all of these in incredible detail. Um, but these are good lessons and working your way through the slides with your class is going to be a good thing. And it's going to actually help prepare them for um, the um, CTF learn stuff that they do. Uh, nice, nice feathers in with an awful lot of other stuff. Uh, and then you have another chance to do a project um, involving SQL. And then we come to this networking fundamentals and thank goodness for CodeHS for sticking this in here in fundamentals. I, think you can probably expect your students to know, to come to your class the first time you're talking to them about cyber with almost no knowledge. And you, you would think, well, students, they're online all the time. They're on all kinds of devices. They're on phones. They're on their Nintendo switches. They want them working quickly. Shouldn't they know something about networking? They almost know nothing about networking. So you're going to have to be going into this assuming nothing. And I think CodeHS does a great job of pitching this at the correct level. And what happens with packets? What is a router? What does a router do? How does DNS work? These are super important. Make sure as you plan your class out to not leave this unit to the end. Don't leave it out. Use this. Your students will be much better off having done some preliminary work in networking, even to the, just this module, um, then they would be continuing forward in their cyber careers with little to no networking understanding. So I, I'm a big fan of this um, as a beginning. And then if you have some students that sort of like messing around with hardware, have them you know, turn, mess around with routers, uh, have them not routers that they that are part of the school's network, obviously, but you can get a, a cheap router off of eBay or something, or maybe your school's IT department has a couple of old things kicking around and you can just log into that and do some of the stuff that's in this module. And again, I would remove this networking fundamentals quiz from the module. Now let's take a look at the IT infrastructure one. Some more discussions of network devices. What's an AP? What does it do? What's a switch? Uh, again, you're going to be having students who have pretty much no idea what is even the core hardware components of a wireless network. Um, they're they're not going to understand how their email message gets all the way down the stack uh, to the physical layer and then across the network and then back up the stack to the uh, application on the other end. So if you can, you can work on that and trace that through with them, they're gonna be a lot better off. And this is, this, these two areas, networking fundamentals and IT infrastructure, 
get ready to face some resistance from students on these and they this is not what they planned on doing they plan on you know maybe doing a little programming and things are going to be great and they're going to be big cyber experts and get paid a lot of money and go and run right out and get a bmw but they have got to learn how networks work and what the hardware that runs them is um, they have to learn that so these are two important modules then you have this final exam that's available to you um, how long to spend on this is going to be up to you uh, I don't think this is a full year uh, course tweaked. It's somewhere in there, but it, the fact that I don't think it's a full year course means I have plenty of chance to use this course and to throw in lots of other stuff like CTF Learn. My cyber course typically is a semester. And as you can see, we pick and choose stuff from here um, uh, and we do other things. And, uh, you know, it, it, cyber is such a big discipline that you're gonna to have to, for your students, you're gonna to have to make some choices and you're gonna to have to decide, you know, we're gonna do this, we're gonna not do that. And that's, that's, your, that's an important role for you as a teacher. Lori, how are we doing with questions at this point? Um, I, th <clears throat> I think we're doing pretty good. I don't see any questions right now. We had a question about what is dumpster diving. Um, but I think we uh, answered that. Great. I'm going to head over to the advanced section then and talk about that for a little bit. Excellent. Let's see, yeah, I think I know what I want to do. Yeah, let's go that way. Uh, you know, I, I certainly am big favor, a big fan of doing projects. And I think in cyber, you have all kinds of opportunities to do some projects. I would try to include some electronics somewhere in there if, if you possibly can with a breadboard or make an LED blink, um, get some simple device like an Arduino or um, anything, uh, you know, lots of projects to do with cyber and there are lots of places to find those projects um, and CodeHS has them. So you can definitely start with looking at the CodeHS projects. All right. So here again, we're looking at this uh, CompTIA ITF alignment. Huh. Um, I like the A+. Now we're talking about uh, listening to a Dartmouth professor and his grad students say, you know, you guys need to be messing around with hardware. Well, an A+, cert is designed for students to, who are looking to be techs in the world and looking to really be in, get their hands dirty on the hardware side. So, you may well find some A plus material out there or have a student that really likes, you know, assembling a system uh, out of a motherboard, a case, some RAM, a processor and some drives and, uh, you know, put those, put those systems together and have them experience that Frankenstein moment where the operating system uh, comes to life is a great thing for them. We're gonna move to, uh, let, me, let me just quickly hop through the, no, let me stay here. Let me stay here because this is really important. I'm going to talk about badges. You heard me talk about certs already. And we are all in the business of giving grades to our students and our students are going to, coming to our class uh, thinking about how important it is to have an A minus instead of a B minus and what's my average and how is this test going to affect my average. But what will really have currency for them if, as they pursue these internships and they pursue jobs are certs. And I have come to think of the badges that Code HS offers and you have the ability to build custom badges as a really great prelude to pursuing certs because in order to complete a badge in Code HS or any other gamified platform, you've got to look at what's coming and go, uh, how much time am I going to spend on this? And then how, how am I going to feel when I earn that badge? And what those students are doing by gauging all that or by putting in the extra work that it's going to take them to get that badge is getting themselves ready to pursue a cert. Because what you're going to want to do with a cert is look at the topic list, master it, not have a master of everything. I get a hundred on everything because that means you spent way too much time preparing for that cert. The cert usually takes 70 or 75% correct. And you want to get more than just that one cert. You don't want to spend five years getting an A+. You know, you need to 
calculate out or measure the amount of time and energy that you're going to invest in getting a cert. And all these things are you you will prepare for by pursuing badges on Code HS. So I think badges are fantastic uh, ways to get ready for certs. And you can print out the badges. You, you, you look at a student's badge and you can print it out. You can sign it. You can have an admin sign it and you hand it to the student and they feel pretty good. They bring that home, show mom and dad, look what I did, I've got this. And they're teaching themselves to pursue certifications, which is really a good thing for them to be doing. So I made some custom badges, like a 30% badge for somebody who gets 30% of the way through the course. Um, this is an example of treating a badge as a cert and you can make up all kinds of interesting badges. Uh, you can have a badge for people that are handling a problem in a certain way. You can have a badge for somebody that's the first person in the class to make it to halfway. Um, you can have all kinds of pretty cool badges. People learn how to use tools. Uh, you feel like somebody is very good at using Kali or even a particular tool like uh, Metasploit or Wireshark, make a Wireshark badge. I and mean, that would be a great thing for, for somebody to have. Uh, collaboration, absolutely essential and really useful to score points in CTF contests. Uh, their collab skills, their ability to include their teammates and to validate their teammates, super important. Uh, do everything you can to praise students who can develop collaboration skills because the people that are looking at them for internships and jobs the big question they're going to ask isn't just, is this student really smart? Can he get solve problems on his own? How well is this student going to fare when we drop them into our flat environment? And there may be a senior general in the room listening in, or there may be somebody who's on their first day of work. How well do they do in that environment? A big question. So it's a skill. I regard collaboration as a skill. Think to yourself about badges that you're going to make for your class. And it's worth the time. It's pretty easy on CodeHS to customize your own badges and, and then go and put the time into awarding them because when you give your students badges or when your students earn badges, they're setting themselves on the road to earning certs. And then we have the certs that CodeHS offers itself. And I happen to think these are really useful. And I push my students to take the cybersecurity cert. I push them to take other certs in CodeHS. They take the Python cert, they take the JavaScript cert, they take the Java cert. And this is, you know, typically an hour and a half is the amount of time you have available and you get something like 40 multiple choice questions. Uh, your students will probably take less than that full hour and a half to do the exam. Uh, and occasionally a student will not pass the exam, but your students are gonna have an experience of looking at a topic list, asking themselves if they're ready, uh, and learning not just to acquire enough knowledge to do well in the exam, but learning that there's such a thing as over-preparing for an exam. Because if you over-prepare for one cert, you've cost yourself time of getting the next cert. And so this is all, these are all skills that are really gonna matter to your students. And, and ask yourself as a teacher, you know, what are these certs doing for your students? And I think a very powerful thing that they do is they, they tell the agency or the company that these students want to go work for, hey, I'm trainable. I, I know what it takes to pursue something more or less on my own. Uh, and I think, I think a student that puts certs on the table in an interview is telling that company, I don't, they're not telling them they know everything. They're saying I'm trainable. And that's what, that's what I think agencies and companies want. I, I don't, I don't, I don't think they want my students at their current skill set. They want, they want students that they can take from me and train. And we want them to get that training that those companies and agencies are going to give them. And when they present a certification, it's not so much a statement of, look, I have enough skill to do the job for you today. It's, I know what it's going to take to get uh, good in your organization. And please hire me because I'm trainable. All right, let's talk about some other things that you can put as out there on the horizon for your students. And I'm still on this topic of badges and certs. A CompTIA Network Plus is a really good one for them to pursue. And I do think this is one that's doable for students in high school. It's gonna be a complete 
uh, flip for people who are coming in and haven't done much networking at all. But this will, if they get that network plus, they'll be A, on their way to getting security plus, and B, will have really filled in what is a major gap for a lot of students, which is their understanding of networks and networking. And then ultimately this big one, the security plus uh, is really the currency of the realm out there with companies and agencies. If you are walking around with a security plus in cyber, you can get hired. Uh, it, is, it is a tremendously powerful cert and it will shorten conversations with people who are looking to hire people uh, or give them internships. So that's, that's sort of the, the big boss at the end uh, of the game uh, that you want to fight and win. And you want to get that, your students want to get that security plus. That will be a tremendous achievement for them. It may be something, I'd say for most of your students, it's going to be something that they will be picking up in college or maybe even at the end of college, a security plus cert. But you need to have that, you know, when they say, okay, well, I'm going to get my, um, Code HS cyber cert, what's next? And then you say, well, you know, you, you like that, you wanna keep going and I do want you to keep going, try for network plus next and then try for security plus after that. There are also some interesting uh, demonstrations in, uh, in Code HS cyber. Uh, this fish, phishing simulation is pretty good. Uh, and let's, let's see, Lori, how are we doing on questions? And we are at 36 after the hour. We are, I think we're keeping up. Oh, how do you deal with uh, student perfectionism? 100%. <laughs> great. great question. That's a, you know, that's great a great question. question. Fabulous. Yeah. As soon as I heard that question, I had all of these student faces flash through my head because yeah. you have those students and that's really tough for them. So, yeah. Well, I, I actually really like the the whole badges and certs thing as an answer to perfectionism because we, we will have students and I have strong students that I love who will come into my classroom and they're used to going after and getting 90s, 95s, 100s on quizzes and tests. And so they have to throttle to a different standard in terms of feeling comfortable uh, enough to take a cert. And that's going to be the battle that that perfectionism brings is how do you get unfrozen enough in your quest to be perfect to take a cert and then move to the next cert. Um, and, and I have students who are, who would be very, who would easily get the code HS cyber cert, for example, whose perfectionism is hindering them from, from taking it. And, you know, I can't, I can't talk to that same student about getting their network plus or getting their, their security plus until I've, until they've taken cyber. And usually when you, they break through and do one, they are able to adjust out of that um, perfectionism and go, well, you know, I didn't get every question right. And there were even a couple of questions on there that I had pretty much no clue, but I still got the cert. And um, no, that's not a bad thing. So that's, that's a partial answer on perfectionism. And nothing in this Code HS course, this is not, nobody would say this is a, this is everything you need to know to be a great cyber person. So you need to be carrying that into the teaching and learning and saying, don't, don't sit here and worry about whether or not you've got hundred percent right on everything in code HS, because you need to be moving forward. You need to complete a lesson, move to the next lesson, move to the next lesson, and then maybe even circle back around, which, which gets me back to my uh, Oracle spiral model, which I won't take everybody's time on today, but you know, perfectionism is a problem. So I'm very much appreciate that question. And I think that certs, badges, uh, and, and putting it on the table that this is, this is not something we're looking for 100% on, but we want to move over territory, cover ground, and build bit by bit, build this, uh, build this knowledge rather than looking for complete mastery of every single lesson and activity. How's that, Lori? Let's go forward. Sorry, I keep losing my uh, <laughs> Zoom screen as I'm looking at the question parking lot. <laughs> That's okay, good for you. All right, so let's take a quick look at the advanced course. And um, it, we've got a couple of modules here. Advanced cryptography, I think would be great uh, for people who've done some cyber and want to move on. And I certainly think this is a great module to do. 
uh, steganography, creating an encryption algorithm of your own to conceal and hide a message within pixels of an image. It's kind of a project. And yeah, I would just uh, push through this. I think this is nicely done. A, a good online platform project should have plenty of levels to it. And, you know, this might go back to this issue of perfectionism that somebody raised so well. Uh, I, in my teaching in um, coding and also in cyber, I don't think it's a bad thing to, to jump to running answers or things that work. I, I, like, I like showing people solutions and talking about solutions. And that may seem like, well, we're not forcing the student to do it all on his own. But I, I kind of favor looking at how things that, that work work over forcing everybody to hit their head against the table for as long as it takes until they get it, quote unquote. So I would bring that same approach into the sort of advanced cyber. Let's just take a look and see if we can understand how some of this stuff works and we'll challenge ourselves to the extent that we uh, feel that it's useful, basically. VPN stuff and advanced networking, let's hop on the course here. Let's take a look. Okay, talking about hashes, super important, asymmetric encryption, important. These lessons in this advanced cryptography unit, I would stress, I mean, I would say, I would say if you're teaching the fundamental course, I would find a way to salt this module from the advanced course into the crypto work that they're doing in the fundamental course. And if you're looking to save time or you, you wanna keep people from getting hung up, I would de-emphasize the written reflections, maybe even have them just do index cards or bullet points for those and make sure that you cover the slide decks here for algorithms, hashes, asymmetric encryption, and definitely you want to be talking about digital certificates. How do you validate, you know, that somebody is who they are and what, what is right and wrong about digital certificates? And again, make sure that you pull this out, this quiz out um, in the assignment field where you can just take it out and use it when you feel like using it in your own way. And then here we have a project which is related to encryption, this steganography project. And I think this is pretty well done. Um, and I would, I would probably include that. Now we have another module here on networking. We start talking about private networks, protocols and standards, mobile devices. Golly, you know, we can't be stressed enough uh, that sometimes we teachers, we, we, we spend a lot of time talking about computers and most people are connecting to the internet on phones. And that has profound implications for security. Phone processes are slower. Uh, people, the user interface, uh, people's fingers wander. There's all kinds of security aspects to phones. Phones have microphones, phones have cameras. Uh, there's, you need, it is incumbent on you as teachers to make sure when you're teaching your students or when you're talking about cyber stuff with your students, to have them looking at cyber through the lens of mobile. Absolutely important. And I think it's very important for students to try to build a mobile app and get a feel for what either Android Studio or Xcode do and where there might be some vulnerabilities in the way apps work. How does an app get put up on the Play Store? How do people put bad apps together? That's an endless discussion and it's very important because most people connect at least as often on their phones as they do on laptops or, or desktop computers. And then we have access control and I would pull this out, this networking quiz. And, you know, there, these projects are great. It's gonna be up to you to decide how exactly you want them to work. You might, you might wanna have your students do these projects outside of class time. And so you would just go straight from the advanced networking module into the cyber defense module. And there we get a little more clinical about uh, particular attacks, common network attacks, cross-site scripting, super important cross-site scripting topic. You can't leave this out of a course on cyber. I think this almost belongs in the fundamental one. Um, 
and it's just the beginning. These are th this cross-site scripting is just the beginning of a discussion on how that works and what your students need to know about it. But again, I, I find this uh, very helpful. This uh, units five of the advanced one. And if you if it means spending less time on a project or spending less time with some of these reflections here to get to the cyber defense module, I would do that. I would make sure that your students get some of this content that CodeHS provides here in this module. Risk management is a little bit abstruse. It's a little bit, it's, it's certainly important. And, you know, my IT head here at school would say, we've really got to, you know, think a little bit about risk management. Pen testing, super important. Uh, and so maybe here we pull lesson four out of risk management and make sure we get that one done. Code just provides exams. You can you can use this if you wish, um, but that's a that's a solid you know additional course this advanced cyber that Code HS offers, and then you get to you can get to the certifications and in addition to the final exams, I would be pushing your students to go for this Code HS Cybersecurity Level One, and the way that works is you they you can buy a voucher uh, from CodeHS. I think they're 60 bucks, or you can talk to your CodeHS advisor about how to get vouchers, and then they will enter this voucher and that unlocks the exam. That doesn't mean the exam starts at that second, but it means that they have the ability to take that exam when they're ready. I think you got six months or something like that to take the exam. And then they, when they start, they have uh, 90 minutes to take the 40 questions. And so why, why? Why can't I just use an exam and declare my kid fit that way? Because this is, this is a good practice run for actual certifications. These are difficult questions. It's administered, the program that CodeHS offers is administered properly. It's uh, graded independently. Uh, it's very hard to cheat on one of these certs. Uh, you know, CodeHS is doing its best to keep uh, its quiz questions off of Reddit, but they're not perfect and you will see some code just material on reddit from time to time but the certs are done more like actual certs and they take good care that these certs are not easy uh, to to work around and just say i i passed the cert so i i personally recommend that you uh consider that you consider having students work to these cert goals on code hs i think they're very much worth it and certainly the cyber one would be a good one of those. Um, let me go back to my deck here. And let's go forward. I want to go past the sample lesson, I think. I don't think I want to do this. The sandbox program is, is a good feature of CodeHS. Um, if you haven't tried it, I would give it a shot. And when you write a program, you can save it in the sandbox. And I think I want to get to CTF Learn and give you guys a chance to try some of that here. Course customization, super important. Reordering modules, really think hard about which ones you want to push and which ones you don't. And you can drag the modules around as you can see this animation does. Um, and think about, for example, in that advanced uh, code HS course, uh, taking some of the networking stuff and maybe putting it in uh, in your uh, fundamental course. So do, do use this, reorder the modules. There's nothing set in stone about the code HS course. It's not, don't make the mistake, particularly your you first year and second year teachers with code HS of thinking of feeling too bound to the code HS scaffolding. You, you can use it as a platform and build whatever you need to build with it. Uh, and I, I commend you to do that. And you can also remove stuff. You know, you, you've heard me, every teacher will look at something on CodeHS and say there's something that they're not really a big fan of. You know, I, there are things that bug me about CodeHS is sometimes they will give an exercise that I think is a little too much of a brain teaser. 
I had a guy teaching alongside me at my last school from Tufts, a really smart guy, loved giving brain teasers, and I would always give him grief about it. But um, you know, you can remove the stuff that doesn't fit your teaching style, and uh, that way your students can move move on and cover ground and get to the next topic. So you're you might be doing them a favor by taking some stuff out. You always have an opportunity to add stuff into your courses using supplemental materials. Uh, you can add uh, YouTube videos in, and there's all kinds of interesting stuff out there on cyber. You guys are all probably bringing some YouTube stuff that you've saved in your channels or playlists. Um, definitely stick that right in the Code HS course. Um, I like to use videos to make my students uh, think a little bit more 500 foot view, but you're welcome to do all kinds of stuff like that. Adding content is a really important. Thing. And then please take a look through the Code HS course catalog, which is vast. And there is an awful lot of stuff there. Um, and you may very well find some stuff in that Code HS course catalog that solves a problem that you have in the classroom or that fills in a gap that your students have. Um, so in any time you're engaged with CodeHS, you wanna be looking at the whole catalog and seeing if maybe there's something that's there that you weren't, um, you weren't aware and is out there. For example, to talk about hardware, you know, one of the simplest pieces of hardware, but that still counts as hardware is the BBC Microbit. I love that little thing. It's really cheap. It is a five by five array of LEDs but you really get a feel for hardware by monkeying around with the BBC micro bit and making those lights flash and making letters go across the screen. Well, guess what? CodeHS has a course in BBC micro bit. So you might want to, and I would recommend that you think about feathering in that CodeHS BBC micro bit course into your cyber course. So then, when they get to Dartmouth and Professor Smith said, have you done anything with hardware? They could say, well, I've messed around with BBC Microbit and that would be a good thing for them to be able to do. BBC Microbit, by the way, has a completely virtual aspect to it. You can actually fire up a virtual BBC Microbit and write code on there or on the Microsoft uh, Microbit platform that runs on a virtual Microbit, but you're still getting a feel for hardware by doing that. So I recommend that adding your own modules, adding your own lessons. These are all possible in CodeHS. Now, we've still got enough time. I've got a couple minutes here. You know what? I, let me just say, let me, let me segue into CTF Learn here. We did a little bit of it. Let's go to the challenges. And let's talk about how that just worked in my class. And what I typically did do with CTF Learn, I, I don't like to lecture. I don't think that many of you guys really enjoy standing up in front of everybody and talking for 20 or 30 minutes. What you really want, what, what I really enjoy is having students working away on the topic that I have in mind for them and watching them enjoy getting better at it. And this is a great platform for that. Um, so you need to fool around with CTF Learn on your own, try some of these questions, try the labs in Learn++, and at some point, you say to your students, you know, you, you put them in teams of two and three, or you let them work on their own if they want to. There's going to be a lot of discussion. There's going to be a lot of talk. How did you solve this? How did you get this done? And uh, it's all good. It's all good. So they're going to be working on these problems, trying to find the flag, trying to get the flag. Uh, here's one with SQL injection here, this basic injection problem. There are a ton of things. Don't let them make the mistake if they think they're really good at cyber of diving into medium or hard problems right off the bat. They don't want to do that. Um, and uh, just basically let them go. Let them go. Get, on, get, get everybody in your class on CTF Learn. Maybe you can take a portion of your class fairly frequently and say this is going to be CTF Learn time. I'm going to track you using this dashboard and you'll see their students uh, you'll see your students pop up on here as a global dashboard. There are people all over the place working here. And this is a great uh, prelude or great uh, warm up for students actually getting in a contest. Once they've done some CTF learn problems, then you say, hey, this is going to be a contest at um, 
that our local organization called Magic will be running. Would you like to be on a team for that? They're going to not be apprehensive about that. They'll be excited. And the Magic contests that are run out of Westminster, Maryland, are open to teams from all over the world. You, you teachers from India, Greece, China, there's no reason you can't put together a team and enter one of these magic contests. Um, uh, I will put, we'll put um, a link to that uh, here um, for you international guys. For example, uh, the last contest that we did at magic, we thought, oh, we're gonna have all these Maryland teams there really weren't that many high school teams at all, but there were a lot of teams from Estonia competing there. Um, and it, it was fun. Everybody had a lot of fun, three hours of work, and they solved questions very similar to these, got points, uh, let, took breaks. When somebody wanted to eat lunch, they'd take a break and uh, you know somebody else would work on a problem. It was terrific. I, I can't recommend this format enough, and you will get better at cyber by doing CTF learn and by doing cyber contests. So Lori, I think that's where I want to leave it right now. We're at five of, I think I want to give one last opportunity for questions. Let me go back to my talk. Let's go there. Yeah, there's me saying, put your students in the CTF competitions. There are other resources. Lori, I'm going to stop my share and let you take it from here. All right, sounds good. Thank you so much, Joe. This has been... Awesome. We've had a lot of good discussions going on in chat, and I think people are really excited about what you can do with the cybersecurity curriculum. Right. Um, <clears throat> there has been a little bit of discussion um, regarding free versus pro teachers, and we can certainly help you out if you've got questions about what pro um, has as opposed to free. And one note that I will also mention is that when I was in my classroom, the entire time I used Code HS, so 2014 to 2019, I was a free teacher. So mm -hmm. just a little side note, you can absolutely use Code HS as a free teacher. Um, so, but we can certainly have those discussions afterwards as well. Uh, so we have a few resources that we want to share with everybody. And I think these will be getting tossed into chat in just a moment. I don't have my chat up. They're probably already there. <laughs> so yeah, they are. <laughs> Lindsay's fast. So definitely check out um, the Code HS Certified Educator Program. If you are using Code HS, we would love for you to join the certified ads. I was a certified educator too. So join the program. Um, there are more workshops coming. We have got more getting posted today and tomorrow. So check out the page at codehs.com slash free PD. We also have more workshops coming up this week. <clears throat> You can also check out those micro credentials that Joe was talking about um, here too. Uh, you can absolutely check us out on uh, social media. And the newest thing that we've been adding to this is our Code HS community on Slack. Um, that link is up in, the, it's the very first link that Lindsay had posted. It's uh, codehs.com slash community dash connect. We absolutely invite you to join that community. Um, we are definitely um, hoping to create a really vibrant, uh, dynamic community there where you can communicate and stay connected with other teachers, other CS teachers from around the U.S., around the world, teacher trainers, the Code HS team. So this is a pretty cool little community. And I made sure to just add a cybersecurity teacher channel. So feel free to join the community and uh, stay connected there. And we have some more workshops coming up. Tomorrow, we have a workshop on teaching mobile apps. And that workshop will be at this same time, uh, 11 Central, noon Eastern, uh, to our workshop on the teaching mobile apps course. I think uh, Julia Trigo will be leading that one. And then Joe will be back with us on Wednesday for teaching middle school computer science. So don't miss out on these. We've got another workshop coming up at the end of the week too on the Code HS Arduino course. So Joe mentioned the micro bit. We've also got Arduino. So you might want to those, check that one out. I, I love one Arduino. More. Hi, Lori. I've got one more little thing to say. I'm having a hard sure. time posting in chat right now. The upcoming contests uh, that are free to enter are in ctftime.org, ctftime.org. And so if you want to get your students to try one of these contests after they've started on CTF Learn, that would be a good place to go. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Mm -hmm.
Mm-hmm. All right. And we've got one more link for you all. If you could take a moment to let us know how we did head out to codehs.com slash workshop survey. That would be great. We want to know what else we can bring to you. So definitely let us know what you thought about today. Let us know what else we can bring you. Uh, we love doing these. This is, I know this is my favorite part of the day. Pretty sure I'm speaking for a lot of others when I say that too. So um, thank you so much for joining us and thank you for giving us some feedback too. So we can decide what to do next for you too. Thank you so much, everybody for joining us again. I, I say this all the time, but I truly mean it. Um, you know, you have a lot of choices in what you can do. It's your summer. You've had a long school year and I know that, you know, we're working towards the end of July already. Can't even believe it. And, uh, you know, we're, you're planning to head back to school soon and you chose to spend two hours of your day with us and, we appreciate it more than we can even say. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining us today for this workshop. Um, thanks to the Code HS team who were helping me on the back end answer questions and tossing those links into chat. They were staying caught up way faster than I was. They are so fast. I don't know how they do it. Um, and Joe, thank you. Thank you again. It was great. Thank you all. I learned something new. <laughs> And something. I learn so much new every single time we do one of these, Joe. So thank you. Um, and thank you, everybody. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, oh, thank you, everybody. I'm just looking at chat and that all your thank yous feel very overwhelming and it's wonderful. It's Great been a privilege. Here. It's a privilege to be here with all of you. So thank you all. And uh, I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Thank you. And uh, I can't wait again to see you at the next Code HS workshop. See y'all soon, everybody. Thanks. Thanks.